Hello and welcome to my very first PIX Insight Processing video. In this tutorial, I'm going to take you through creating this Ubalesque image of the Rosette Nebula from a series of images I took in January 2021 of the Rosette Nebula from my back garden using my 071MC ZWO cooled camera and my Spree 100. The great news is, I'm actually going to give you the data, the exact same data that I took that night, including the calibration frames. So there's a link in the description below to a zip file. Once you've unzipped that file, you should end it with a structure, something like this. There's the dark flats, the darks, the flats and the lights. And those are the files that we're going to combine together and hopefully come out with something along what I've got on the right hand side of the screen. There's a couple of prerequisites we need to check. So the version of PixInsight needs to be the latest one, which is version 1.8.8-8 or later, and that's as of July 2021. The second thing you need is a third party tool, which is free called Easy Processing Suite. And again, I'll put a link to this site in the description below. It's dead easy to install. The instructions are actually on the screen, but again, I'll put some notes in the description below. Once you've got that installed, I use part of the, the tool set during this workflow. So hopefully if you follow along, we should be able to create something akin to this at the end of it. So let's crack on. So with the prerequisites out of the way, the first thing we're going to do is to stack our images. And what this is going to do is combine all the data that I've given you into the start of the image that we're then going to process through to the final image. You'll notice over here on the right hand side, I've got some icons laid out. I'm only going to use these as a reference for the workflow that we're going to go through. So each of the steps, I'm actually going to use the traditional menu options that you find under these two options here, processes and scripts. So the first thing we need to do is stack our images and we're going to use the built-in weighted batch pre-processing script. That's going to take our images, going to calibrate them, align them and spit out a image that we'll start to then process into our final image. So if we start off by going to script, batch pre-processing, weighted batch pre-processing, that will launch the script. Now there's a great new feature in the latest version of the weighted batch pre-processing script, which allows us just to specify a folder where all our lights darks, flats, and biases if should we have them located. Prior to this version, you'd have to load each of those in individually. So down here, there's a plus directory. So if you then choose the folder where you've extracted the data set to, which has got the darks, dark flats, the flats and the lights, and just press select folder, it will load every single image in that's contained underneath those folders and it knows from the fits header whether they are darks, flats, or lights. So press OK. And then if we just have a quick look under the dark section, we've got two sets of darks, because we've got some dark flats. Under our flex section, we've got the flats. And then the light section, we've got our light images. So the next thing we need to do is we're going to say we want to subframe weight them. And what that's basically going to do is it's going to measure the quality of the stars, the signal to noise ratio and various other parameters. And it will use the best ones that it finds out of that to use as a reference image. Just want to check if you press the weighting parameters that the preset is set to nebula. You'll notice that you can choose galaxy or cluster. Obviously the reset is a nebula, so we will pick that. We need to make sure we register our images but we're not going to use Drizzle at this moment, so I'm not going to cover Drizzling off in this tutorial. So we'll untick Drizzle. And then finally, we need to say we want to integrate the images. So this is actually the final part of the process that the script goes through, where it, it brings together the final image. We need to specify an output directory. So what I normally do is I create a new folder under where I'm processing my things, and I'll call it PIX. Then I'll just select that. And then one last thing is this new option in the latest version called Control Panel shows you the status of all the images that we've loaded. Now, one of the things I like to just double check 
is going through each of them and making sure there's no settings that we need to, to adjust. The one thing that I do generally do is on the light frames is I pick RGGB because sometimes it doesn't detect the correct Bayer pattern within the image uh, when it's set to auto. And I know that the camera that I used to capture these images, the ASI 071MC, has an RGGB pattern. So I'm just going to select that and say apply to all light frames, say yes. And then just double check we've got ticks in status, dark and flats, so it knows how to calibrate and align them all together. And then finally we're going to press run. And we'll get a diagnostic message saying that we've got no bias frames provided. And that's absolutely fine because we haven't shot any bias frames for this particular image. Then I'm going to press continue and we'll see that the integration, the calibration, the alignment and the final image will start to be created. Okay, so once the weighted batch pre-processing script is finished, you'll end up with this smart report, which is the output of exactly what took place. We can press done, and then we can finally close the script. So if we now browse to the location where we asked it to save our files, you should find two darks, a flat, and a light. So these are the files that are stacked together. The one that we're interested in is the master light. So if we open that, this will actually open what appears to be four files. These are the rejection files that it took out during the stacking process. So we close those down and the one we want to be left with is the one that's got integration in the title. And if you do a quick stretch of that, we'll see that's the result of the weighted back pre-processing script and the image integration that it's done. What we're going to do next is apply a linear fit to the image based on the best channel out of red, green and blue that exists in this image. So we want to look at the statistics of each of the channels. So if we go to processors, all processors, statistics, and if we pick our image, what we're looking for is the lowest mean value in these three. And we can clearly see it's the red channel. It normally always is the red channel, but it's worth checking. So we can close the statistics down. We now need to extract the red, green and blue and apply the red channel ADU to the green and blue channels. So up here on the toolbar, there is split RGB channels and we'll get three new windows, one for red, one for green and one for blue. If we now go to processors or processors, linear fit. We want to pick the red channel as our reference. So we come in here and pick R, press OK, and then we simply execute that on the green channel. We know it's the green channel because it's in the title bar. And then we do the same for the blue channel. Only takes a couple of seconds. We can close the linear fit down now. Now what we want to do is to recombine the red, green and blue back into an image. So we go to processors or processors, channel combination. And for the red, we want to pick the red. It usually does a good job of working out which is which. However, if you leave it on auto, it doesn't seem to. A bit strange. So once we've got that, if we hit the apply, not that one, apply global. We end up with a new image. We can close down now just for tidiness. The red, blue, and the green. And I'm actually going to just minimize this because this is no longer our current image. Image 08 is. We have a quick stretch of that. Looks basically the same, but the background ADU has been manipulated on the green and blue channel. Okay, so the next thing we're going to do is background extraction. And we can do that in two ways. We can either do an automatic background extraction, or we can do a manual background extraction using the dynamic background extraction utility. So let's close the channel combination down. We don't need that anymore. I'm going to actually do it the manual way, which is using the dynamic background extraction tool. 
we need to click on the image and then if we go down under sample generation and hit generate you'll see it's put these little boxes around the image if you tweak these values here of the sample radius and the samples per row you will get more boxes and more sample points you can experiment with those settings but the key thing you need to do now is to check each of these boxes and make sure they are not sat in the nebula or on a star so you want them to be basically in a nice place that's void of anything that represents the background so spend some time in moving these points around I'll pause the video and then we'll come back to when we execute it finished moving the points it generated around I've also added quite a few points of my own into the background simply by zooming in and clicking an area not on a star and that adds a manual point as well so you'll notice as well um, I've left this section quite void of any sampling points and that's because I believe that this red that you can see is actually part of the nebula whereas this green cast over here is definitely uh, part of the imaging artifacts that have been created while capturing the image so once I'm happy that I've got all the sampling points I need to go to the target image correction and choose subtraction and then if I drag and drop execute that will now do the background extraction and once again it creates as a new image and it also creates as an image which we can have a quick look at to see what the background colors and gradients were extracted so and close that I'm going to minimize this image now that we just did because that's no longer our current image this new one that's got underscore DB in is and if we extract that or stretch it sorry then that looks better there's still a green cast down here a little bit but that's something we can deal with in a later process so a couple more things to do here we'll close down the dynamic background extraction we'll go to processors all processors background utilization we'll just neutralize the background and then you'll notice the green cast has come back ever so slightly we'll go to processors or processors SCNR color to remove green and we'll drop that on there that gets rid of that green cast so at this point I'm going to actually change the identifier to RN instead of image 08 DBE and then I'm actually going to save the file so this is something I do quite often is I start to save my files at regular points so even though you can go back using undo in Pix Insight, I find saving a file makes me feel a little bit easier in case something goes wrong so I'm going to call it RM for Rosette Nebula DBE background neutralization and make sure we save it not as a PNG right now but as the native XISF format okay let's move on to the next step okay so we're going to do some color calibration to the image now so we can close down SCNR close down background utilization go up to processors and then select color calibration I'm just going to accept the defaults for this so we just drag the execute on there and we're done close down color calibration and we'll go on to the next step so we're going to do some sharpening of the image using something called deconvolution and I'm going to use the easy processing easy decon script to help me perform this you can do it manually um, but once you've discovered the easy processing suite it makes it a lot easier so go to script easy processing easy decon I understand and the first thing we need to do is in this top view option is pick our main image and it will show a preview of here I'll just move these things a bit more central and the first thing we need to do is create a star mask and if we hit new create new process star mask this will invoke starnet++ to 
extract the stars from the image and leave us with a starless background. Don't worry, the process will put that back in later on. I'll pause the video here because Stanek can take a little while to run. Okay, so once the star mask has been generated, you'll notice it's filled your image with black dots over in the preview. Don't worry about that, that's what it's meant to have done. And you'll have these windows open behind the scenes with the actual star mask again. Don't close these down. So we now hit the deconvolution tab and we need to now generate the point spread function for the stars. I won't go into the technical details of what this is doing, um, but you may need to tweak these values here. Um, it'll tell you over on the left hand side in this window when it starts to run if it can't detect enough stars. This should only take a few seconds, again depending on the speed of your PC. This, as you can see however, it's detected 2311 stars, so I'll pause the video until it's caught up and we'll get on to the final stage of deconvolution. Okay, once the PSF is being generated, you should end up with what looks to be a star in over here and another little window over here. Again, don't close these. And then we're ready to do the final phase, which is to actually run the final process within the deconvolution script. Um, we can do an evaluation and that will actually show you what it's done as a preview over here, what the results will be, or we can just get on and run it. So for this purposes, I'm going to leave everything as default and I'm going to tell it to run. And again, this will take a little while maybe four or five minutes. I'll pause the video and we'll come back and see what we've got. Okay, deconvolution's finished. And what we should see is, again, depending on the parameters, you, you may have tweaked them, you may have left them different, and it obviously affects uh, what target you've got. So different targets will act differently to the, the deconvolution parameters. Uh, we should have an, uh, a subtle sharpening that's taken place. So I'm fairly happy with that. So as ever, I'm going to close down any of these windows it's left behind. I'm going to change the identifier so I know where we are. So we've convoluted and I'm going to save the image again. So we've written the original one. Never mind. Okay. So that's deconvolution out of the way. We'll proceed to the next step. Okay, we're going to look at denoising the image for the first time. And the way we're going to do that is using the Easy Denoise script found with inside the Easy Processing Suite. Before I do that, I'm just going to make a clone of the image by dragging it off to one side and then minimizing it, just moving it out of the way. And what we'll do is we'll use that as a comparison when the Easy Denoise script is finished. So to actually start the denoising, we go to Script, Easy Processing Suite, and easy denoise. We need to choose our image. So from this pull down, we need to pick our image. So my image identifier is RNDBBN. You see over here, don't pick the clone. That will bring up a preview. And then you can either choose to tweak the denoising settings. I generally find that the defaults do a really good job. So I'll start with the defaults and see how you get on. When we go through the comparison after this is finished, you'll see how good a job it's done. And when we're ready to go, we're just going to hit the run button. And I'll stop the video and we'll come back when it's finished. Okay, so the denoise is finished. Uh, it did leave a couple of windows behind which I've closed down. Uh, as long as you don't close your main window down and move this out of the way. We'll bring back our clone that we took before we did the denoise so we can do a comparison. So let's zoom into this area up in the top left hand corner. So this is the image before we did any denoising and we'll try and get to the same sort of zoom scale. Go right into the corner and then we'll do the same on the denoised image. Don't one too far. There we go. So those are zoomed into the same scale and you can hopefully clearly see this noised background that we had in the original has been totally smoothed out by the denoising function. So a really nice job. So I'm happy to close the clone and then we will proceed with the next step.
So what we're going to do now is permanently stretch the image. The image is currently in a linear state and we want to make it a non-linear state. Once we've done that, the image will be permanently stretched and that will enable us to go on to the next stages. So to do that, we need two tools. Go to Processors and pick the Screen Transformation function and then go to Processors and pick the Histogram Transformation tool. On the Histogram Transformation tool, change the view to be your image. So first thing we need to do is reset the stretch, form the stretch, and you'll notice it's it's a lot brighter all of a sudden from the previous stretch, and that's just because the previous stretch was a lot less aggressive. Drag this execute and drop it onto this bar over here. You'll notice the histogram appears. Reset the stretch and then drag this from the histogram onto the image. The image is now in a non-linear state, so we can unstretch this. Nice and straightforward. I'll change the identifier to be STR, just for my own preference, and we'll save it so we know it's been stretched. And we can close down the screen transfer function and the histogram transformation tool, and we'll proceed to the next step. Okay, so we're getting to the exciting bit now where we're going to start manipulating the colors to give it a more obelisk appearance. But before we do that, what we're going to do is remove the stars from the image temporarily um, because that just makes it one of the stars won't be affected by the change that we make. Um, and it lets you see what you're manipulating a little bit easier as well. So the way we're going to do that is with the Starnet tool, so under processors, Starnet. Make sure you tick create a Starnet mask and then you can choose what stride you want. Now the higher the stride number the quicker it will be, the lower the stride number the more time it will take but the better removal it will do. Now a word of warning unless you've got GPU accelerated pixel insight modifications if you go down to say 32 that will take literally an hour on a decent PC. Stick with 128. For the purposes of what I'm going to do, I'm actually going to go down to 32 because I've got a GPU accelerated Pixel Insight, which will it'll take about five minutes instead of 50. So choose your stride. As I say, choose 1 to 8. I'm going to use 32 and execute it. Sit back, go get a drink, go watch some TV, and we'll... Wait for this to finish and then proceed with the next step. Okay, once Starnet's finished, we should end up with the Star Mask. And I'm going to just minimize that. Don't close it. We need that. We can close the Starnet program. And then I'm going to change the identifier just to make this next step a little bit simpler. I'm going to call it RN. What we're going to actually do is split the RGB channels again and we're going to discard the blue channel but make a new blue channel from the existing green and the existing blue. I'll show you how to do that now. So if we go over to split channels we should end up with an red, green and blue and you can clearly see there the blue channel is the weakest So we're going to reconstruct that by combining green and blue together and we do that through pixel map. So under Processors, Pixel Math, this is the expression you're going to need to do that. So make sure you've got use a single expression and we're basically saying here this image which is rn underscore g, the green channel, add 0.4, so we're doing a blend of 40% of the blue channel with the green channel and we're going to create a new image so make sure you've got the create new image ticked don't worry about any of the other settings then hit apply you should end up with a new grayscale image and it's got your number might be 127 don't worry about 
what that is, you just need to know that it's got a, a unique name. What we can do now is we need to recombine these back to a starless image, but with the new green channel. So again, we're gonna use pixel math for this, but this time I'm going to reset the settings. I'm going to untick this use single RGB expression and I'm gonna use the expression editor. In the red channel, we just want the RN underscore R for our red image. In the green channel, we're going to do open brackets 0 0.6 times the red channel, close brackets, plus open brackets 0 0.3 times, and then the new image. So in my case, it's image 127. So this is the new image, the new blue image we created. And then close bracket. And then in the blue channel, we just want the new image we created. Press OK. And then we need to say create a new image. And we want this time the color space to be RGB. So just to quickly go over that, we've got red in the red channel. We've got a blend of the red and the new blue that we made. And in the blue channel, we've just got the blue, the new blue that we made. If we hit apply, we get a new starless image. So we can close these grayscales down, make sure you don't close the star mask down. And I will minimize this. We don't need the new blue channel and I'll just move that up there. This is now going to be the image we're going to be working with. I close pixel math and we'll get on to the next section. Okay, as we're going for that obelisk look and feel, we need to start manipulating the curves to adjust these colors. Before we do that, I'm actually going to pop a mask onto it and I'm going to extract the lightness channel by clicking this guy up here and we'll end up with a grayscale image. And what we can do now is drop that onto the image and that will create a mask. We know it's created a mask because this guy's gone brown. But let's have actually look at the mask. So everything in red is protected, everything not red will be attacked. So we'll just toggle the mask so it's not visible. And then we'll bring up the curves transformation tool. So the first thing I'm going to do is adjust the saturation. That will certainly start to make... Oh, before we do that, I'm going to pop up a preview. So, I don't want to overdo it, but I also want to make sure we get a decent popping to the image. So I brought up the saturation a bit. Let's have a look at what it was before, after, before, after. Then to try and get these yellowy oranges to come in, I'm going to adjust the green channel. Start bringing that up a little bit in the middle there. It's all personal preference. And you can spend, I'll say, hours manipulating these, uh, going around in circles. Um, but for the effects of the video that we're doing today, that's not too bad. So I'm going to close the preview down and I'm going to drop that curve onto the image. So we need to do something about this background. So I'm going to reset my curves. Because we've got this mask on, I'm going to invert the mask. And if we have a quick look at what that looks like now, most of the nebula is protected, not fully, and a lot of the background is going to be attacked. So let's toggle the mask view back off. I'm going to choose RGB slash K and choose a preview as well again. Now, we might be a little bit aggressive here, but we can actually get, we're going to crush effectively a lot of those blacks, but we're also going to get the nebula popping a lot more. now. You don't want to create too an artificial look and feel. 
if we go right down to you know we've got nothing practically left of the image so let's bring that back up and you notice the image appears to get sharper as well Ooh, let's start again bring this guy down Have a look at what it was before. Before, quite a washed out background. Too bad. I'll go for there. So, if we apply that onto the image now, we'll reset the curve. We'll take off the mask. And then I'm going to save the image just in case we want to come back and tweak it. So I'm going to call it RN DBE stretch and I'm going to call it starless. Current state we're at. Then we'll go into the next section. So we're going to go back into curves. I'm not happy with the golden yellow. It's not as pronounced as I'd like, so I'm going to adjust the red channel, bring up a preview, let's start in the middle, just gently lift that up a little bit, and there we've got more orangey glow to those dust clouds on the outside. So close that, and we'll apply that. Close the curves transformation. And then, just before we add the stars back into the image, I'm going to perform a little bit more sharpening. So under processes or processes, we need to find the local histogram equalization. We'll bring up a preview and this will be awful. Um, and that's because this amount value is set to one. So I'm just gonna slide that right down to, let's try 1.4 to start with. So that's after. Not before. Maybe a little bit too aggressive with that. Getting a bit messy in the background. Yeah, quite happy with that effect that it uh, created there. So we'll apply that. This will take a few seconds. And then close that down and I'm going to add the stars back in so back into pixel math I'm going to clear any expression and then we just can use the expression editor and say our main image which is this the identifier plus the star mask which hopefully you haven't closed press OK and execute Close well, pixel math down, and then we've got our image back processed with the stars back in. One thing I've noticed is some of the stars have got probably a green cast to them. So what we can maybe do now, just see if we can get rid of that, is to run an SCNR with the green channel. Let's take that does. I think it's taken them off ever so slightly. Let me undo, redo. Not a great amount, but slightly better. So anyway, that wraps up the tutorial. Hope you found it helpful. If you want to have a go with the data I provided and send me your final image, do feel free to do so. I'll put my email address up on the screen now. So uh, again, thank you for watching. If you want to drop a like and a subscribe, it'd be much appreciated. Until next time, clear skies, and I will catch you on the other side. Bye-bye now.